So I'm going to explain one of your major assignments or quests through the semester, which I'm calling your magazine mission. And I'm going to start by saying a little something about my philosophy of education. Have you ever thought about trying to define what is education? I mean, obviously learning stuff, but how much of it do you need before you can say you've had an education and, and what kind of stuff constitutes an appropriate education, you know, and, and is it what somebody else says that you need to know or what you've decided yourself that you need to know? And if it's you in the driver's seat, just exactly how are you going to decide on what the things are that you need to learn and go out and learn them, especially given since you haven't had the education yet, how do you even know, you know, what's out there that maybe you do want to know before you can consider yourself educated? So all right, this is a complex problem. Uh, but one thing that I feel certain of is that you should not regard education as simple obedience to your teachers. I say this to my undergrad classes all the time. The university is not obedience school. Um, sometimes they're not happy to hear that. They wish that all they needed to do to get a good grade out of me and, and all their other teachers and the credentials and the diploma is to briefly go through a relatively short list of stuff, you know, memorize these terms, read these books, say back these things which were said to you. That's not good enough. I also, when I think about my own education, the bulk of it, at least the largest number of books and articles that I've read in my lifetime, are ones that I sought out for myself or that I came across in some way. Only a tiny fraction of them were something that I was assigned to read by a teacher and had to read for a class. So in a sense, only a tiny fraction of my education came from my teachers. Um, that's not to say that I regard my teachers as unimportant. Uh, some of them were. <laughs> some of them were not that bright or not that good at teachers or, or whatever, but I, I had a long education and I've had a lot of teachers and I admired a lot of them. Uh, there were some that I really admired and looked up to, lots of them in fact. Uh, and even so, most of what I learned didn't come from them telling me, you, Gene, sit down and learn this. It was more that I looked up to them and thought, ah, I want to be like that. and, and what do I need to read to be like that? And, and only sometimes was it stuff that they gave me or imposed on me. Uh, the rest of it I gathered together for myself. And I think that is a feature of true education as opposed to simply getting the grade or getting the diploma. That is something that you have to want yourself and actively seek for. On the other hand, if education is not obedience, it's not the whatever you would call the direct opposite of obedience either. Uh, it's not complete self-indulgence. Um, or it's not complete rebellion and resistance to what your teachers may say or what your textbooks may say. And I've known students who came to college specifically with the goal of getting through it without being influenced by those professors. Um, either they or, or possibly in some cases their parents had the mindset of they didn't want their, their kids <laughs> or themselves to be corrupted, you know. Uh, so if you're sitting here in class and your primary goal is <laughs> the way I already look at the world is right and I am not going to allow it to be impacted. Ah, I used impact as a verb. Some people don't like that. Never mind. Uh, I am not going to be changed by anything that I hear or read in college. I think that is not really education either. True education, you are continually evolving as you go along, becoming a different person, hopefully a, a larger, better person. Uh, but that will take forms that you couldn't have anticipated or even imagined before the education took place. Um, education should change you and it will change you in ways that are unexpected sometimes. 
if you never read anything, if you never try to understand anything other than what's already in your comfort zone, what you can understand easily, um, and if you are only willing to give brain space uh, to contemplate arguments that you already agree with, positions that um, you already support, that's not an education. You're robbing yourself of an education if you do that, if, if you're that type of resistor or rebel. Okay, here's uh, some kind of definition of education. It's your ever deepening and widening engagement with the world. Uh, why engage with the world? To understand it better and more of it, to get as much of it within your grasp as you possibly can, and to appreciate it. You know, this is there should be some pleasure involved in this. Uh, and, you know, if you also then want to go and take your new improved understanding of the world and use that to improve the world, make it a better place, be my guest. I'm not against it. Education will help you do that. I don't think that that's required to be a goal of education, but it's certainly uh, compatible with it. So, it's not obedience and it's not self-indulgence. The process of getting educated with the use of teachers and organizations and, and some kind of institutional structure, think of that as a negotiated collaboration to change your brain from what it was in the before state to what you want it to be in the after state, which you don't even perhaps fully know yet what that is, but you'll figure it out as you go along. And this is a collaborative effort involving uh, labor on both sides and consent on both sides, something like a good marriage. If you're in a good marriage, your partner regards your autonomy and well-being as sacred and something that they should work toward as well as allow you and protect you as you work toward it. But on the other hand, you can't, in this relationship, expect that you're going to have total control over everything, all the mutual decision making and do whatever you want. And things are always going to be nice for you. <laughs> you have only experiences you enjoy. You don't have to ever compromise. Nope. You have to respect your partner, too. And what do I mean by partner in this analogy? Well, whoever, whatever. Uh, the mentors and authorities that you have chosen for yourself or, or that the institutional structure that you've chosen for yourself puts you up against temporarily. Or in another way, your partner is the whole rest of the world, you know? It's always you and the world in a relationship. I urge you to be open and receptive, but that doesn't mean you have to be a doormat. I urge you to allow other more experienced people to benefit you as you read and study and gain and experience yourself, but it doesn't mean you have to turn off your own brain. You know, your own critical thinking mind can be engaged the whole time and you can think, eh, well, I don't know about that. All right. For a good education, at least some of the time, you have to involve yourself, engage yourself with sources of information that you yourself didn't go and choose. Uh, what do I mean? Some part of your education includes following up strands yourself. You know, you decide, oh, I need to know more about such and such, and I'm going to look in Wikipedia about it, or you're on Facebook, and um, you. Uh, click on what your friends have suggested and you follow up on the stories that interest you. Or there are electronic news services that you can subscribe to and um, they will suggest articles to you that are follow-ups on what you've already been reading. You know, the, this kind of uh, software that will tailor itself to you and the more it learns about what you have preferred to read in the past, the more it will suggest that you read some more stuff that's like that. So that's not the way to get outside your comfort zone, obviously. It's not that it's not informative, it's just that that can't be your whole education, is always pursuing what you're already familiar with and already know that you want. So 
the best possible education includes some amount of surprise. Things that you wouldn't have picked for yourself, didn't pick for yourself, maybe didn't even know was out there. You should be surprised sometimes for a good education. A magazine can give you that. And that's why I'm giving you the magazine mission this semester. In my own life, uh, magazines play a big part in my ongoing education. I don't feel like my education is over. Um, what I get out of a magazine is uh, something deeper in terms of interacting with news of the world, right, um, than I would get from something that is a, a daily news source, whether that's online or the radio or TV or, or even a print newspaper. Um, magazines are going to have articles in it uh, that didn't have to be written quickly, that um, the person or people who did the research had plenty of time to really dig in and get it right and think it over for a long time. Um, in the magazines I subscribe to, uh, I get frequent updates on what other educated people out there in the country are paying attention to right now in our society. Uh, stuff that I wouldn't necessarily know about other than the magazine let me know. Um, from some of the magazines I like, I get updates on what's going on in science and other scholarly pursuits. And what I'm talking about here is not a specialized journal uh, that, that you would read in your particular profession. Let's say you were a molecular biologist, right? I, you're probably not if you're taking this class, but just for an example. If you're a molecular biologist, you have molecular biology journals that you subscribe to and, and read thoroughly, or, or maybe just go to the library and get whatever, uh, look through databases. It's very specialized information that you need professionally, um, and that nobody who's not a molecular biologist could probably follow at all. That's not what I'm talking about. I'm talking about general readership magazines, although elite ones, one's designed for intelligent, educated people, uh, where the specialists bring their work to you, to the rest of the world. And you're not a molecular biologist, but something happened on the cutting edge in molecular biology that everybody ought to be interested in, and here it is in the magazine. Uh, and another thing that I get from my magazines is a steady stream of book reviews. Because, just like I was talking about before, What do you need to learn? You know, how do you choose and organize your own future learning? Well, a magazine helps me do that by showing me what are some of the books that are out there right now that are being published and what some intelligent and educated people thought of them. And that's going to help me structure my own future learning. Um, I get a lot not only out of the book reviews proper, but even uh, advertisements in a publishing related magazine or, or a specifically book related magazine. Um, the advertisements are going to be based on that kind of readership too, uh, that kind of information. If you subscribe, for instance, to my current favorite magazine, the New York Review of Books, Even if all you did is look at every advertisement that every publisher puts in here to see what are the new books coming out from that publisher, even that would be an education in a way what's going on in publishing right now. It gives you a sense of the field and if you hope to be a published writer, that sense is one of the things you need to have. And I really don't know any other way to get it other than to keep track of these things, what's going on in publishing who's publishing what, who's advertising what, right now. This is what the publishing marketplace looks like at the moment. So, okay, let me show you, just for a minute or two, uh, some interesting features of my current favorite magazine, the New York Review of Books. So most of what's in this magazine is book reviews. 
and most of them are not uh, book reviews only. That is, their goal is not just to tell you, here's what's in this book and whether it's good or not. Um, but if, uh, if it's a, a, a nonfiction book uh, in some scholarly or scientific field, uh, the person who wrote that book that just came out in that field is a major expert in their field, right? And the person who's reviewing the book is also a major expert in that field. Well, you, the reader, are not a major expert in that field, and the book reviewer knows that. So one of the things they do is they take the trouble to sketch out for you the entire field. Here is the current picture of things in, let's say, neurobiology, you know, the latest research and philosophy of, of the mind-brain uh, correlation. And they will bring you up to speed knowing that you are not an expert. They'll tell you as much as they need to know doing all the work themselves. It's, it's like being boosted to sit on somebody else's shoulders and then you can get the view that they have, right? You can see further than you could have seen on your own. Um, you get the picture, you get the lay of the land, here's what's going on in neurobiology, and then you get the book handed to you, and then you get this reviewer's assessment. And, uh, and the, their sketch for you of what the major controversies are and how the book in question did or didn't respond or is or isn't getting things right, um, once you have a taste for this kind of writing, uh, nothing else is near as satisfying. Nothing else gives you as much oomph per word as this does. Now, as I said, the advertisements in this magazine are useful, but one thing you do have to watch out for is the New York Review of Books, and this is not true of every magazine that you might look at, but this particular one um, accepts advertising from uh, what you might call vanity publishers, either people who have put their own book out themselves just because they want to, um, I, I will pay some money and get this bound up as a book, and I'll pay some more and advertise it in the New York Review of Books. Uh, so y you don't want that. Um, don't, don't be fooled into thinking that um, those books are the equivalent of uh, refereed books that are published by um, important scholarly publishers. This is page two. Uh, new offerings from the University of Chicago Press. There's nothing on this advertisement page that gets me wildly excited that I think I've got to read that book. But I do notice each title and each little blurb topic. Uh, and one thing that I notice on here is that I recognize one of the authors. Desmond Morris has written a book called Monkey. Uh, It's, he's been relatively famous for his whole life. Um, he wrote a book called The Naked Ape, which came out in, I can't remember if it was the 60s or the 70s, but anyway, quite some time ago. So it's interesting to me to see that Desmond Morris, the renowned zoologist, is still publishing uh, this late in his life. Okay, moving on. On page five, there's an advertisement from Princeton University Press. This one called Jane Austen Game Theorist uh, catches my eye. Um, I am extremely interested in both Jane Austen and game theory. I would never have had any idea that somebody was going to connect the two of those things um, if I hadn't happened to see it in this advertisement in this excellent magazine. So I don't know if I want to buy this book, but I'm going to add it to my list of potential books to read, and maybe I'll get it on interlibrary loan like you guys are going to have to do with some book sometime this semester. 
and uh, check it out. And I don't have to read the whole thing if it's not interesting or exciting, but I will have expanded myself by just that little bit, just by knowing that this book exists, you know? There's a couple of other things that interest me on this same page. Uh, one called The Muslim Brotherhood, Evolution of an Islamist Movement. I probably won't pursue that to read it, but I'm glad people are publishing books on it. Uh, here's another called Beyond Our Means, Why America Spends While the World Saves. Again, I might not send away for this, but just even the knowledge that somebody is publishing on this topic shapes my mental picture of what kinds of books are being published and are being read. Here I am on page 65. This is an ad from Ex Libris. Or I guess you pronounce it Ex Libris. Okay, this is a vanity publisher. So this ad does not deserve our attention and if you want to cast your eye over it, go ahead, but I'm not going to waste my time at all. These are people who got published because they paid to be published. So the New York Review of Books doesn't tell you that. It just counts on its readers to be savvy enough to figure that out. And uh, Ex Libris paid the money and put this ad in to prey on the unsavvy. Uh, don't be fooled. These aren't real books in the same way the others are. Same thing here on page 71. iUniverse, Author House, those look like vanity presses to me. Um, I haven't particularly heard of them before, but they don't sound like real publishers, and I'm looking over the books, and the books, they look like vanity published books to me. Here's a tricky one. The independent press listing. That's a mixed bag. Again, anybody who wants to can pay for books to be advertised in there. Uh, but also, some legitimate but very small presses uh, will occasionally uh, advertise a book in the independent press also. So for this one, um, you can't uh, immediately, well, well you can, but you don't have to immediately reject it like you do the obvious vanity presses. Independent press can, can have a mix of vanity and, and sort of real publications both. So, and that was just the ads. Um, so let me show you a couple things also from the main table of contents, the actual articles. Uh, first of all, this is a highly prestigious journal. Uh, most writers would do anything to get into here, uh, and they can afford to be very, very picky about who they choose. Um, so you may have heard of some of these names before. Uh, Freeman Dyson, who's uh, reviewing a book on Robert Oppenheimer, um, the physicist. Uh, Martin Scorsese, you know that guy. Um, Edmund White, you may have heard of. John Paul Stevens is uh, reviewing a book about the Voting Rights Act. Uh, John Paul Stevens used to sit on the Supreme Court, you may know. Um, and there are other names on here that are familiar to me from, from reading. Uh, as for the articles, um, the lead article this time is about um, the uh, massive spying program by the NSA, the prison program. Uh, it's called, They Know Much More Than You Think. Um, uh, I was very interested in uh, this piece on page 28. which is a review article, meaning there's more than one publication involved and under review. Uh, it's, in this case, it, it's not <laughs> review of books per se, but, by, but Supreme Court decisions, okay? So here are four Supreme Court decisions discussed in detail. 
uh, two of them having to do with um, homosexuality, uh, uh, marriage equality, and two of them having to do with um, voting rights and how to protect them. Uh, I read that with intense interest and I sort of knew what was going on in the Supreme Court cases because they have been discussed in the news, uh, but after reading this article I feel like everything has really nailed it down for me. There's a review of the new memoir by Amanda Knox. Do you know who Amanda Knox is? She's that girl who was arrested in Spain and, and charged with murdering this other girl uh, along with her boyfriend. I had vaguely heard of the case in the news, like I don't even remember when, a few years ago. Um, it went on for a long time and, and then they finally let her out. Uh, and now she's publishing this memoir which I probably will not read because I suspect the writing is not going to be all that good. She's a very young woman, even though something uh, startling happened to her, something definitely like newsworthy and interesting and bookworthy, that doesn't mean she can write. And she had an assistant uh, write it with her. That's not a good sign for great literature. So I'm not reading this book, but I loved reading the article which told me all about the case and went into great detail, uh, much more than they had ever done on the news. In fact, this, is, this article is kind of a critique of the journalism that um, surrounded the case. Uh, and that's interesting to me because I care about journalism, you know, and writing, and who gets to say what the truth is. These are things that are intimately connected with my own profession of nonfiction writer. Okay, that's just a sampling of some of the things in here. And here is what is now my second favorite magazine in the world, The New Yorker. When I was a little younger, it was my favorite. It's a little bit easier reading than the New York Review of Books, which I guess when I was younger that was my preference, but now that I'm older, it's the reverse. Uh, but again, this is a highly prestigious magazine that almost any writer would love to be published in, and for that same reason, um, they can afford to be very picky about what goes into the magazine, and they have a lot to choose from. And uh, I won't say that every article or short story in here is the best thing ever, um, but I will say that this is a venue in which some of the best nonfiction writing in the world routinely appears. The ads in the New Yorker, there aren't as many of them. Um, and it's not, I, I still look at every one of them, but it's not such a big thing for me in this magazine as it is in the New, Re, uh, New York Review of Books. Um, so let me just mention a couple things from the table of contents. Uh, the lead article is called Daughters of Texas. And it's about, it, the subtitle here is Cecile Richards that's uh, the current head of Planned Parenthood, and the abortion battle, which if you've been watching the news at all, you know stuff is going on there in Austin. Well, and this is an in-depth article about that by somebody who is not from Texas. So this is kind of an interesting angle, right? To know how Texas looks to somebody from the East Coast. I read that with Gary Interests, and here's uh, another um, about Google Glass. You know what that is? Probably you've heard of it. Uh, this is written by Gary Steingart, who is a rather famous fiction writer, young fiction writer. Um, and he, uh, he wrote a kind of science fiction-y, near future dystopian book about everybody getting hooked on their electronic media and being kind of subservient to them. So, and, and he, um, competed for, applied for, and got 
uh, one of the prototype Google Glass, and so here's his article about that experience. And here's a piece called Trial by Twitter, uh, which is about the Steubenville rape case, which uh, has been a, another big deal in the news. And again, this is a reporter that spends a lot of time and resources and goes to the locations and interviews a bunch of people and makes an in-depth, highly accurate account uh, that's better than just these, these quick reactions, um, news day by news day. Uh, after reading this article, I feel like everything I knew or everything I've been told about that case before is in some doubt. Just one more thing that I want to note about The New Yorker. I am looking on page 76, which is the theater section. It's a review of three new plays that are currently appearing in New York. But just glance, okay, at sentence number one here. Wallace Shawn's primary impulse in his dramatic work is to fuck with the audience. Not through content, though he messes with that too, but through form. Blah, 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 blah. Okay, why did I read you that? Are you surprised that a New Yorker writer, a writer in the, I would say really the top, most prestigious magazine in the country, the one that all the writers want to be in, uh, are you surprised that he uses a, an expression like fuck with? I get students in class sometimes that complain or are surprised or even shocked by the language used by literary writers that we're reading. When that happens, I know these people haven't been doing much reading lately. It is now common for educated readers and writers to use four-letter words that some decades ago were considered low class and that they had to be filtered out of highbrow um, intellectual content. Uh, the trend is the other way these days. Um, it is considered appropriate and acceptable um, for people with elite writing uh, intentions to use uh, this type of vocabulary. Now, it wouldn't be acceptable if the guy dropped in a racial epithet. That's different. Uh, but um, uh, as a mark of kind of casualness and the opposite of stuffiness, and sincerity, uh, it's now considered acceptable to use words that in previous decades um, were considered unacceptable because they uh, mentioned sex parts or um, bathroom stuff. Now the only way that you're going to know that, you know, what types of vocabulary are acceptable and in use among sort of the general highbrow elite audience in this country is to read a lot of that. Uh, that's something you can get out of magazines. That's something that you can get out of this magazine in particular because this magazine in some ways sets the tone for the whole country. At any given time, I'm usually subscribed to about three magazines. Uh, always the New Yorker and always the New York Review of Books. And the other ones I kind of rotate. Um, I try something new every now and again. I used to get the New Republic as a, a news source, but that's less important to me now that I get a lot of my news from podcasts. Um, I've subscribed to the Times Literary Supplement, which is kind of like the 
Great Britain version of the New York Review of Books. Uh, the London Review of Books is very good also. Granta is excellent. Um, Harper's and Atlantic Monthly, I subscribe to them off and on uh, when they offer me great deals and, and when I don't have too many other magazines. I don't put them in quite the same league as The New Yorker, but they're a close second. And um, if you like them, you can use that instead. Uh, because I'm a college professor, I get special offers in the mail all the time. They love to have professors subscribe to them and possibly recommend them to their students and possibly, as I'm doing now, um, impose them on students as textbooks. Uh, I got this from Columbia Journalism Review. It's not just criticism. Um, the struggle for accuracy and fairness in the 24-hour news cycle. New tools and technology for those working in media. The pluses and minuses of social media, etc. And they're going to give me this for just $10. I think I'll take them up on it. Uh, that's for six issues, so it comes out only once every other month, evidently. Um, and uh, normally it would cost 30 but they're giving it to me for 10 I, I think I'm going to take them up on it. I'm not a journalist myself, but I have gotten very interested in new media, including podcasting, so uh, maybe this will give me something of use, and if not, eh, it's 10 bucks. So your assignment is as follows. I've given you textbooks for this class and talked about them on the first day and showed you them and you can go to the bookstore and see them physically and buy them in person and you must buy those textbooks, they are required. But I'm also giving you one extra required textbook in this class, namely some highbrow magazine. Uh, so I, I'm not going to force you to pick, to, to take any one particular magazine, although I certainly recommend the ones I subscribe to myself. Um, I'm going to give you a short list of definitely acceptable magazines and you can take any one of those. Um, I would prefer that you subscribe to it, but if the financial hardship is too great, um, I would accept it that you just consult it regularly at the library. That's, that's fine with me. Uh, either way, in the portfolio that you turn in at the end of the semester, you're going to have to provide me evidence that you have had a long-term relationship, a deep and meaningful relationship with at least one magazine this semester. And I want you to, to play the field a little at first, but then settle down with one that's going to be your magazine. You and it are together for the semester. If the magazine you choose to have your relationship with is a weekly magazine, that's fine. You only need to pick one and you're done. If you take something like the New York Review of Books, um, which only comes out once every three weeks, I want you to be doing something every week. So if that's your primary significant other, you're going to have to fill in the other weeks with short-term flirtations with other magazines. Uh, so not only will I provide you with a list, I'm going to put up a wiki on our class Blackboard site, and uh, other people can suggest other magazines and, and also podcasts, and I will... Um, Take them under consideration because there are a lot more possibilities besides the ones I've said. I, I do want to have the option to be able to say yes or no, though. So in addition to showing me in your portfolio evidence of this long-term magazine relationship, um, you're also going to have to show me evidence that you have read many book reviews through the semester. And just for the sake of concreteness, I'm going to give you a number. Ten. All right? At least ten book reviews you must read throughout the semester, and your portfolio will show me evidence of that. Uh, one way or another, either you'll give me a, a quick one-paragraph pressy of each one, or um, you can give me Xerox pages with your annotated comments or whatever, I don't care. If your magazine that you hook up with doesn't provide enough book reviews, you will have to look for them in other suitably highbrow sources, which we will talk about during Library Day and or on the class wiki. So this concludes 
my explanation of your magazine mission. That's the end of this broadcast.